Oh, this game just starts. All right, hey everybody, today we're doing a let's try of Lookouts. So you're sure we can trust this friend of yours as info? It'll be a crying shame if you're wrong about this. Let's turn a controller on, this probably works. This guy is someone to ride the river with. He'd never sell me bunk information. That town has struck gold. That's what he heard. Up oh, controller doesn't work. Oh well. Heard? He just heard about it? What kind of source is that? We can't go off rumors, you nutcase. Uh, but... Think about it. Uh, uh, we'll be living like English kings if we can take over a supply like that. What else are we gonna do? The last drop was a bust. We got nothing left. Hmm. All right. We've had some bad luck and are running low on supplies. We'll take that town by hook or by crook. And if they don't have that gold, we can take them for what they do have and skedaddle. The lookout will go early in the morning and see what we're up against. But I reckon we can bulldoze this burg and have some fun either way. Make sure to bring us back some juicy details, won't you, tomboy? He firmly slaps you on the back. Laughter fills the camp around the roaring fire. Sounds like you'll be riding up, riding at sunup to check out the town out. You feel it's best to get some sleep. This is a western story about furry trans men. Link in the description if you want to check it out in its entirety. The desert is an orange haze. Scorched sands whip up around your horse's legs, the sun hot against your back as you ride towards this town. There's not much to be done while riding. The desert is lonely, harsh, bare. Only thing to do is think. You don't like being alone with your thoughts so often, for so long. But you always are alone as the lookout. Alone being the odd stick of the gang. No one talks to you unless they need something. You daydream as you ride, like usual. Flights of fancy, of setting down somewhere. You're tired of the curly wolf and his gang, though. Is it so much to ask to be able to live in peace? Uh, to be able to live in peace? To not have to fight for survival? Always on the run? Maybe that's what your life will always be like, gang or not. A hunted outcast. They could have sent you off with some playing cards at the very least. You come to an outcropping near a cliff, try, uh, tying up your horse. You approach the edge and see the town come into view. A nice frontier town. Small, but clearly bustling with people. White, painted signs on the wooden buildings glint and bloom in the midday sun. You can't see much else from way up here, and turn to get your binoculars. You open your saddlebag and pull the metal binoculars out, brushing it against your poncho to dust off the lenses. Turning back to walk to the edge, a figure suddenly rounds the corner of large rocks you've decided to set up camp under. Ah! Gah! Out of instinct, you, your hand snaps your holstered gun and pulls it, trained squarely at the head of this new person. The bird, who seemingly came out of nowhere, looks at you, clearly just as surprised and out of sorts from your own appearance, your own presence. He shifts backwards, eyeing your hand on your gun. What did I even say a second ago? Would you, would you... Is there a back button? I feel like I read something just horribly wrong for a second there. Anyway, the air feels very still all of a sudden, and given you have the upper hand, you take a moment to, to look at who you just crossed paths with. He's definitely an, an outlaw, like yourself. A rugged beak shining in the sun centers a face you admittedly find charming. His face and arms are marked with scars, and a large, sawn-off shotgun hangs on his holster. Since he's a bird, you know to be wary. 
Just like he'll know to be wary of a canid like yourself. Howdy there. What's your name, partner? Joseph. And what are you doing all the way out of here, Joseph? You seem a dreadful long way away from where one might think you should be. Ah, uh... I'm ask you the same question. You stare him dead in the eye. He's pretty calm for someone having a gun pointed at his head, but you can see some of his feathers quivering. You were, tr were you trying to sneak up on me, Joseph? Rob me blind where no one else can see? I bet you thought a fella missing an arm would be easy. Uh, no, sir. Uh, I had no idea you were here till I walked around this here rock. He pats the red stone beside him as if to make a point. Sir? What in Sam Hill? You lower your gun, like your shoulder joint just gave out, and let it hang there. In all my years, no stranger has ever called me, sir. Well, well, color me surprised, fella. You'd have to be blind or full, of, full as a tick not to see an upstanding gentleman. The not to see a, a upstanding young gentleman. All right, all right. Now you're just licking my boots. The hawk puts a hand to his chest. God is my witness. I ain't lying to you. You holster your gun and snort a small laugh. May he strike you down as penance, then. What are you doing out here, picking flowers? The smile drops from his face. He stops short and swallows, like he can't bear to say the next words. I'm part of the Black Vulture Gang. I'm on lookout here to survey this here burg. That's very forward of you, considering I just had a gun pointed your way. I'm part of the Curly Wolf Gang. I'll be damned. You boys have been all over the West. What brings you here, right here? Much the same as you, I would imagine. Rumors of gold. You'd have it just right. Well, I can imagine what my boss might want me to do, coming across someone who's sticking their beak in our business. Joseph tenses up, feathers ruffled. He understands full well what you mean. Conflicting interests and all. But he's not here. Will be a real waste of a good bullet he's on you. Is that an insult or are you trying to make a mash on me? Oh, they're blushing at each other. <laughs> the small jibe is enough to make you stop talking and search for the binoculars you threw when you pulled your gun. Turning your face away to hide the blood rushing to your cheeks under your dark fur. You dust the binoculars off again and walk over to where Joseph is standing, his eyes keenly trained on the town. You don't need no binoculars, huh? No, sir. These eyes can see all the faces of those people down there, no problem. Sir. Again. Maybe it's just a habit of his to call people that. Mmm. Having a reaction here. They, they called him Tomboy back at the camp. Say, why do you keep calling me sir? I ain't your boss. You just that much of a polite sucker? Costs nothing to be kind on the trail, I've found. What do most call you then? Ah. Uh, you thought this might come up, of course. You're surprised it took so long for him to ask about who you are, what you are. Most would say tomboy, I would think. Or other things I wouldn't repeat in such polite company. And what would you call yourself? The question takes you by surprise. Something else no one's ever asked you. Uh, I'd call myself a man. Huh. Is that so? He's gonna think you're a nut now. You just know it. You'd be better getting on your horse right now and riding back than staying another staying another round with, uh, with this stranger. Staying another second around this stranger. I'm a train wreck. How funny. I guess we're in the same boat if I'm picking up what you're putting down. 
Might say that the guys at camp don't use sho shove the queer to talk about money. You nod at him, unsure whether to laugh or not. Neither of you seem sure what to say now. Instead, you hold the binoculars to the bridge of your nose and investigate the town, looking down into the valley. After a spell of looking at nothing in particular in silence, you take the binoculars away from your face again, readjusting to the late morning light. You glance at Joseph's keenly trained eyes, then back to the town. You can't help but stare at the clump of a dozen, dozen or so buildings. You couldn't help but think about the real people's lives going on down there, every day. Deaths and celebrations, harvests, prayers. How you were going to hurt him. How you both were going to hurt him. I don't get it. Joseph's voice snaps you out of your staring. Why would Black Vulture want to come here? There's nothing here. No mines in use, no bank. And they sure as hell ain't rich by the looks of things. Maybe they struck a new vein. This is a miner's town after all. But you're right. Something strange going on. Well, two sets of eyes are better than one, right? You want to work together? You watch my back, I watch yours, deal? A huge feathered hand shoots out at you in expectation. You look at his face, and you both lock eyes for a moment. You're not sure what, but there's something in his eyes that makes you feel... seen. Being looked at rather than through. They're, gonna, they're just going to run off together, aren't they? That's where we're headed. <laughs> you gently grab his hand, and a second winged hand clasps on and gives your whole arm a big shake. Whoa, careful there. You don't need to lose another. He lets go and puts his hands on his hips, smiling at you. Hey, come on now. Let's get on down there. He walks past you and heads towards a winding, rocky pathway down the side of the valley cliff. You take a moment to look at the town again, walking along the cliff edge to catch up with Joseph. Wondering if he could see how red your face had been under your black fur. I'm saying, um, I'd guess no? In Echo, they always make a point about saying that their ears are burning, because that's where, like, there's thicker, th thinner fur, supposedly. Clambering down the cliff face, the shade of the valley is a welcome change after your long ride in the sun. The climb down is quiet. Only a few grunts and gripes. A couple voices of concern from Joseph you quickly waved off. You both approach a wooden sign you spotted a little ways off, swaying in the desert wind. It looks relatively new. A board hanging on two chains, a word carved into the wood. Can you read it? It was only a single word, but you couldn't piece together quite how to say it. Ah, uh, no. Ah, well, I'm sure someone will tell us. You know some familiar smells drift on the wind as a gust blows through the town past you. Tobacco smoke, whiskey, stewing meat from somewhere. It reminded you of the camp. Walking more into the town, you get a better look at the buildings that were just dots on the cliff. There was a saloon, at least, seemingly one of the older buildings in the town. As well as what you guessed was a sheriff's building, although the sign outside looked to be busted up. Everything else you could see from here seemed to be houses and whatnot. Leftovers clearly made by miners, not built to be sturdy or last long, but had been fixed up to be livable for folks. <laughs> clearly the people here like this place, and if they get a whiff of why you're both here... Alright, partner. I'd say if, if, we, if we get given any evil eyes, we hightail it out of here. Ain't worth getting shot in a place like this. Sure thing. We got each other's backs, remember? You nodded him. We best get to talking to people. Daylight's burning. 
Oh, here comes someone now. Sure enough, you see a short figure approaching you from the sheriff's office. You hear the pound of a cane on the dirt as they limp towards you with vigor in their step. Is that bearded dragon? Look at them. When they get closer and the haze of the desert heat obscures them less, you see a smartly dressed old lizard standing before you both. Cane in one hand and a metal flask in the other. Howdy, fellas. I'm Sheriff. Welcome to Clemency. Sheriff's a funny name. A pleasure to meet you, uh, Sheriff. He gave the lizard an expectant look, waiting for a name. My name is Sheriff. Just Sheriff. That's all you need. And what do you call yourselves? My name's Joseph, and, and my associate here is... He gestured towards you and turned to look at you. Uh, uh, yeah. A subtle panic running across his eyes. You realize that he just realized you never gave your name. What is your name? Robin is fine. Click. I'm Robin. Pleasure to meet you. He said this while looking at Joseph, resisting an urge to wink at him before looking back to the sheriff. So what brings you two to our fine town? We're just riding through. Needed a rest stop. There a problem with that? Joseph nudges you with his elbow a bit. Glancing at his eyes, you can tell he's saying, Don't be so rude. No. No, not at all. I'm just the closest thing we have to a welcoming committee. It's always nice to see some new faces all the way out here. How long will you be staying? The saloon has some rooms if you'd like to stay the night. That's an awful kind... Uh, that's an awful kind offer, Sheriff. Awful, awful offer. That's rough to say. <laughs> but we'll be gone before nightfall. At least that's the idea. Maybe we'd like this town so much we stay. Joseph and Sheriff both chuckle, and Sheriff sighs. Well, you boys let me know if you need anything else. I'll be at home, most likely. Will do. Yep. With a tip of the hat, Sheriff turned and started walking back to the building at the end of the road. With a lizard out of earshot, Joseph turns to you. So, partner, what's your plan? You look around the town for a moment, surveying the handful of people walking about, talking to each other around their houses. Taking in the warm wind blowing past you with a deep breath. We get talking to folks. And what? They just run their mouth about all the gold they found? No, but I reckon a town this size, if they struck something, there'd be a buzz about. We ask them about themselves, about the town. Someone will spill sooner or later. Alright then. Well, uh, got a pretty good peep at the place on the way down. We got a saloon just here. We got some sort of town hall on the far side, and we got sheriff station at the end of the road by the looks. Where to? Let's go down to the saloon. Let's check out the saloon. I reckon if anyone knows anything about these rumors, it'll be in there. Alrighty then. Time to drink and forget your troubles and then realize you just need to run off together and leave both these gangs behind. Walking through the doors of the saloon, you're hit with the very familiar smell of tobacco and alcohol hanging in the air. A couple patrons drink and talk quietly in the corner, not taking any notice of you two. You see a dozen or so tables, and looking up, there's a second floor with, with the room's sheriff mentioned. Well, howdy there! Your attention is grabbed by an excitable and friendly voice coming from a short bird standing behind the bar, who was now grabbing a couple glasses. My name's Bartholomew. What can I get you fellas? He started wiping the glass expectantly, glancing between you both as he as you walked the few steps from the doors to stand at the bar. 
I'll get a beer. All right, all right. And you? I'll, uh, I'll have what he's having. Yep, coming right up. He set the mugs down and disappeared through the door behind the bar into a back room. Uh, I don't have any money on me, Joseph. Don't worry about that. It's on me. He pats you on the back with the big w wing a couple times, but withdrew his hand when he saw you wince a little. Oh, sorry. Was it too hard? No. Uh, no, you're fine. You hadn't winced from pain. You just weren't used to someone touching you. Like that, at least. Friendly-like. Bartholomew reappeared with two shot with two glass bottles, tipping them into the mugs with satisfying glugs before taking a couple coins from Joseph. Thank you kindly. You will take a sip. Joseph seems to enjoy it, but you find it a bit more bitter. You try to pull a face. You like it? Uh, not like it? You smile weakly. Uh, not my thing. Noted. He winks at you and you feel your cheeks redden a little. You both keep drinking while the bartender busies himself behind the bar. The saloon is quiet. A piano sits gathering dust in the corner, seemingly untouched for many moons. Wind whistles through a gap in the saloon doors, carrying the sound of desert insects. Slow day, huh? You look up from your drink and see that he's looking at the bartender who doesn't seem to have taken any notice. He glances at you both and realizes rather sheepishly he was being talked to. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon? Uh, a slow day? Nah, this is about the usual. Gets a lot more lively than the evenings when the sun goes down. Everyone comes here to take a load off. So you know everyone here pretty well then? Well, of course. Not exactly a big town. We're a pretty tight-knit lot here. Why is that? This is a mining town, right? These places usually explode with people. Uh, well, can't say I know much. He looks oddly unsettled by your question. How long you lived here for? He perks up again from whatever you said that troubled him, the brightness returning to his voice. Oh, well... I'd say somewhere close to eight years? That's a darn long time. Heh, <laughs> I suppose it is. What made you stay? Never mind staying, how'd you even find this place? I've never even heard until we've stumbled past. Bartholomew's cheery smile dropped a little, morphing to something more wistful. Like the face of someone looking at an old, now bittersweet photograph. You, uh, you boys ask a lot of questions, don't you? You and Joseph look at each other for a moment, expecting the other to say something, but nothing comes out. I don't mind. To give it a fair shake, this town ain't the most exciting. It's nice to talk to some new ears that ain't tired of my squawking already. He gives a little half-hearted chuckle. Well, I found this place because I heard about there being gold. Like a lot of folks, I was fixing to get my fill. You and, your, you and Joseph both lean in a little at the mention of gold. My fiance was running away from home, and I was going with him. We thought we'd go out west and make our fortune. Looking back on it, I get why so many called us foolish. I might have been one of them if it were the other way around. But we had our hearts set on it. We followed the road by a wagon, and it was damn tough, hellish even. Thank our lucky stars we made it here into clemency on a wing and a prayer. That was when we really felt like we were foolish. When we got here talking about gold, we almost got run out of town. I don't know the details, but there was a lot of trouble here when miners ran this place. No one's been digging for decades now. The word hadn't traveled far enough, it seems, to let us know at the time. 
At first, Sheriff told us to leave. Didn't want no more of our kind causing trouble. The one Sheriff saw how stuck we were. How we had nowhere else to go. How rough the journey had been on us. Sheriff's nothing if not kind. Could see we weren't troublemakers. Just wanted a better life somewhere. He shrugged, like there was nothing more to it. While the town's help, we gussied up is the... With the town's help, we gussied up this here saloon to something I could run. And the rest is history. I'm glad y'all found something I... So, bleh. <laughs> Said that weird. I'm glad y'all found something here. Yeah. I can say that for sure. Calamity may be small, but it's something real special if you ask me. So there's no gold here. Bartholomew leaned back against the shelves behind him, crossing his arms. Not as far as I know. The mines are around here somewhere, but I've never seen them. This hasn't been a mining town for a long time, and folks here don't mi don't think of it as one. You'd do well to keep that in mind. He tapped the sides of his beak as if to say, if you catch my drift. Even so, I'll be interested in the history of the town. Afraid that well runs dry here, but there's others who have, have been here far longer than I have. You can always talk to Sheriff if you haven't yet. Sheriff made this place what it is today. Wanna know something? That's the lizard... If you wanna know something? That's the lizard to talk to. Thank you, Bartholomew. No problem. It's my pleasure. Bartholomew stood up from his lean and stri... From his lean... Oh, cause he's leaning, right? <laughs> I was, I was ready to have the cadence of lean be like an adjective leading into something. Bartholomew stood up from his lean and stretched his back and arms a little. Slinging his cloth over his shoulder, he picked up a small clinking and rattling box before walking through the back room. Daylight's burning. I think we best get going. Agree. You stood at the bar and waited a moment while Joseph downed his beer, and then yours too. I hope you can hold that. Ah, please. How little you must think of me. Only a couple beers. You should have seen me at the long branch and dodge. Drank the entire gang under the table. You can't help but smile at his cockiness, unsure whether to believe him. You briefly think back on the times the gang had gone to bars. You were always told to stay outside, don't wander off. A dog on a leash waiting for a master to come back. Staring into lamp-lit streets and hearing the braying crowds all around you, drunken strangers enjoying each other's company as much as their liquor. At first they told you it was dangerous for you to stray too far. Then they started telling you to stay outside after you'd beaten the teeth of a guy out of a guy in an alley you who you knew had been staring at you. Couldn't have you causing them needless trouble. Off so soon? Bartholomew re-emerged into the bar, looking expectantly. Well, don't be a stranger, strangers. You're welcome to come back later when the bar's more lively. My husband would love to meet you both. More gay. The casual lilt of his words caught you off guard. You think you see Joseph stumble a little. Failing to get any words out, he just tips his hat and you both leave the saloon, stepping back into the dust and dry desert heat. I was primed the moment there were the moment that uh that that some kind of significant other was mentioned, I was like, pronouns? Pronouns? What, what, what are we going for here? Just sort of like one waiting for the the hint, but it didn't come until right at the end. Town Hall. There might be a meeting we can drop in on at the Town Hall. Seems worth a look. Sounds good to me. I wouldn't mind sitting down a spell neither. You both start walking to the outskirts of town, weaving between the clumps of houses and down the dirt banks. 
You keep walking on a flat stretch, smooth and compacted from the frequent travels of people. Some townsfolk on their porches wave at you or give a little afternoon as you pass on by. Is it just me, or does it feel like everyone here is nicer than most? Well, maybe, but I ain't complaining. He gives you an enthusiastic wave. He, g he gives an enthusiastic wave to a small kid, shyly hanging around outside their house, under the shade. I can get used to folks being nice to me. They're not usually. I mean, I don't stray far from the gang a lot of the time. Maybe this is normal. Yeah, I suppose I wouldn't know either. You arrive at the large wooden building you'd been heading towards, noting how similar to a chapel it looked. If they don't interact with basically anyone besides their gang, I'm kind of surprised that Joseph is, like, well-adjusted socially for conversation and all that. Because Robin kind of seems like a mess, but he, they seem to have a similar background. Joseph walks up the small steps and opens the door with a rattle, holding it open for you. Thank you kindly. He follows you into the short, darkened hallway, closing the door behind him with another wooden rattle. The meeting hall is fairly large and simple and bright. The wood walls are varnished and gleaming from the ample sunlight filtering through the arched windows. Rows of benches line the aisle, half facing away and half facing toward you on each side. Sitting on a nearby bench turned away from you is a hunched figure in black. Hearing you come in, the figure jumps to life, rising from the seat. They turn to you both, revealing themselves to be an elderly tortoise, holding a small book in one hand. Ah, do my eyes deceive me, or do I see new visitors in our town? He walks with the characteristic slowness of someone his age and nature down the aisle towards you both, but with a sprightly spring in his step. Just an incredibly slow spring to his step. He tucks the book under one arm and extends both his hands to shake hands with Joseph and then you. Welcome. Welcome to Clemency. And to our meeting hall. I am Jacob. And what might your names be? I'm Joseph. And then here's this here's my associate, Robin. Pleasure to meet you. I assure you, the pleasure is all mine. It has been a good while since we had fresh faces around here. Now you'll have to excuse me, but I have some business to attend to quickly. Feel free to sit and pray here until I return, if you wish. Before you can ask any more questions, he shuffles between you both and out the door. You and Joseph look at each other quizzically, sitting down at the nearest bench together. What did he say? Sit and pray here. That's what I heard too. Is this a meeting hall for prayer? The meeting house of God? I don't, I don't get it. You can't help but smile at his musings as he looks around the room, looking into the rafters of the ceiling before turning back to you. You lock eyes with him, staring into the honey gold and brown streaked rings of his keen gaze. He smiles at you coyly and looks away, readjusting in his seat. You realize you were holding your breath. You sit on the bench more too, sit up on the bench more too. The hard wood at your back reminds you of a church days. All the fuss and protest against your mother about your Sunday best. You don't miss the frills and laces at all. You do miss singing hymns with her. She had a beautiful voice. I don't remember the last time I prayed. Don't cross my mind very much. Can't say you're missing anything, all the good it'd do you. Not a believer? 
I don't want to blaspheme, but God's done a whole lot of jack squat to help me all my life. Don't really feel like praying to someone who doesn't care about me, or anyone like me for that matter. Which is why I wouldn't have you pegged for a devout man. Joseph laughs a bit, almost mocking the idea. No, no, I... I don't think anyone could accuse me of that. Not with some of the things I've done. But I still pray. Only the Lord knows if he's listening, but it helps me remind... It helps remind me what's, uh, important to me. A lot of the time I just pray for family. Hope they're doing fine. I hope they are too. There was a momentary silence between you, like the subtle shift of coals in a long, burning fire, now snuffed by the door rattling open again. You looked behind you, and sure enough, it was Jacob shuffling in. He grabbed a broom and briefly swept some dust he tracked back in, tracked in back outside before closing the door with another rattle. Forgive me for the delay. I hope I haven't kept you two from your business. Don't worry yourself, we're just doing fine here. He leaned in and nudged you playfully. Good, good. So how may I help you, gentlemen? The word catches you off guard a little. The way it trips off his tongue so easily. No bitterness or mockery. Joseph seems to stall for a moment before a little wry smile returns to his face. He adjusted in his seat to turn to Jacob, who had now taken a seat facing you on another bench. Well, we're just passing through, but I'm curious, you mentioned something about prayer. Ah, well, yes, of course. You must forgive me. I'm clearly far too used to the usuals of the town. His slow drawl of words is comforting. Like being told a long-worn story by a grandparent. This is a meeting hall for friends. Quakers, if you will. We're a largely Quaker community here in Clemency. Quakers. Quakers. Oh yeah, there's a lot of you folks in Pennsylvania, over in Pennsylvania and the likes, ain't there? Yes, indeed that's true. In fact, this is where I hail from. But I must admit, it has been a long time since I last visited. Sorry, I gotta say, I'm at, I'm at sea here. I've never even heard of Quakers. I can't say I'm much more enlightened myself. I don't know ain't, nothing about them. You both turned to Jacob expectantly. Well, what's the simplest way I can explain our beliefs? He fell into deep thought for a few moments, eyes staring into the middle distance before coming back to life. We believe that there is, that there Okay, it is just a, kind of a strange sentence, but I think it's intentional. We believe that there is that of God in anyone, in everyone. That we all have a inner light that guides us. We don't perform sermons or sing hymns. Instead, we pray in silence together. There are no guidelines as to what you should do other than try to connect and listen to the light within yourself. We also very strongly believe in pacifism and do what we can to promote peace. Denouncing all forms of violence and the degradation of our fellows who walk the earth with us. It's important to respect the light of God within everyone. That's certainly how I see it. That sounds nice, but well, things don't often work that way in my experience. Jacob smiled wisely, likely having heard the same sentiment many times before. Yes. There's certainly some that adhere to it more than others in town here, but it's always been an important tenet of our community. So everyone in this town are Quakers? Well, yes, and no. 
Many of us are, but some... Many of us are, but some of us more so just adhere to the same principles and ideals of nonviolence and so forth. Quakerism isn't enforced, but it bonds this community. Huh. Interesting. What about old Sheriff? What about Sheriff? With the pacifism and whatnot, doesn't seem like it'd be easy. Oh, well. Yes, I can see how you might suppose that. Sheriff cares about keeping the peace, but isn't solely responsible for it. We all are. It's what made this town so easy to keep going. Me and Sheriff see eye to eye on many things. So you and Sheriff have been here a while then. Did you found the place or something? You'd have believed it by the tortoise's age. He could definitely be as old as this town. Aha. <laughs> no, you flatter me, for I am not quite that pioneering. But I have, indeed, been here for a long time. If you'd indulge me, I could tell you a little of my story. Please do. Jacob nodded, again drifting off into thought for a moment before coming back with his words. As I said, I'm from Pennsylvania. During the height of the gold rush, with so many heading west, many Quakers thought it would be of benefit to follow. I was much younger then, much more eager to get on the trail and spread the ideals of the friends. Although I can't say my love of blabbing has waned much. He gave a charming and hoarse little laugh at his own jibe. The trail was very hard but I learned much from the others in the caravans and towns and cities on the way. So much life and light. I arrived in this here town maybe more chipper than I had left, but it was not to be. His expression softened, drawing into himself, emotion failing to find its way onto his face. I loathe to speak ill of my fellow man, but when I arrived, this was a godless place. The miners had little care for each other. Be it out of greed or desperation, they were consumed by their need for gold, even those who had had their fill. The whole town was tense and unpredictable. Arguments. Even violence would erupt whenever something valuable turned up. A new vein, gold in the river. They'd do whatever they had to to get what they wanted. The night I arrived, they told me of the so-called savages that used to reside there. Very little makes my blood boil, I tell you boys what, but the way the miners talked about those Indians. How... Happily, they told me stories about the ways they drove them out. Unspeakable things. Things I dare not and would not want to repeat to anyone. I tried explaining the friends' way. How even the savages, as they called them, had the light of God in them. How we were equally important in the presence of God's light that the people we share this earth with were not our enemy. They had no care for my explanations. They had no care for the needs or lives of others than themselves. It made me wonder how Quakers past had convinced people of the evils of slavery, of the importance of peace. Building bonds instead of destroying one another. I lost hope. I thought maybe things had changed so much. Perhaps this was the people's limit. Tolerance of those who could get in their way was no longer an option. Or perhaps I was just a failure, unable to convince a single soul of giving a damn.
the old tortoise looked forlorn, brow furrowed, like he was reliving these these moments so vividly that they were the same faces he wore. Then along came Sheriff. Oh, Sheriff. I was a little worried when Sheriff was first assigned to the town. Then I'd just have another person to fight with. Someone with authority on the side of the miners. Instead, I found a kindred spirit. Someone who actually listened to me and agreed with me on many things. Very quickly, we became firm, firm friends. Eventually, Sheriff got sick of the miners, decided enough was enough, and shut down the town, forced the miners to move elsewhere. The entire time he'd been talking about the Sheriff, his face was lively and lit up, his hands moving with his words. It was a lot like how your pastor used to give sermons. Surely there was resistance to a whole mining town being packed up like that. Of course. But Sheriff did what's right. That's the way Sheriff's soul is set. I had felt buried by the weight of the town's hate. Their convictions like stone walls I could not scale. I'll be grateful to God until the day I die that Sheriff came here. I was given so much hope when I'd lost it all. And you've been here ever since? Jacob chuckled. Yeah, we have. Only a handful of us stayed after the miners left, and it was hard to know whether this town would still stand. But we felt sure we could find more people who cared, as long as we worked together. More people like us. His words hung in the air, settling around you and Joseph, as Jacob settled his gaze on you both. So... Those mines are still around? Hmm? A lot of mining towns die because of the gold drying up, but if the miners just left, I guess there's some still there. Well, yes, I suppose so. I can't say I've thought much about it in recent years. We don't encourage those looking for gold. I'm sure you understand. It's nothing but trouble. His warm gaze turned somewhat steely. You weren't sure how long it might go on for if Joseph didn't pipe up. Course, course, Jacob. We're just a curious bunch. Thank you for talking with us strangers so long. His stern eyes disappeared in an instant and, we hum and he humbly waved away Joseph's thanks. No, no, the pleasure's all mine. It's been good to talk to new ears. My chair is always telling on me whenever I change my position. <laughs> Just sitting around all day. <laughs> if you'll excuse me now, I must get this place tidied up before today's meeting. Quaker meeting? Yes, indeed. You're both welcome to join us if you'd like. Thank you, Jacob, but I'm thinking we'll be off anyhow. Uh... Or thank you, Jacob. But I'm thinking we'll be off, anyhow. Whoa, I forgot that they were taller. <laughs> you all stand, stretching and shaking off the stiffness from wings and tails and legs. Go well, and keep the light close to you. You both nod and leave through the same rattling door as before, catching one last glance at Jacob starting his chores before you close it. Starting to feel guilty, ain't you, about your whole goal? Both your gangs want to turn this place over. What are you going to do about that? Joseph stands with you for a moment in the porch of the meeting hall, looking off into the town. What you thinking? Well, we know these folks ain't going to put up much of a fight. Maybe some of them, but... And there's definitely gold here, somewhere. Joseph had no real emotions playing across his face, but he was standing much more still than you had seen him before. Like he was trying not to breathe. Come on, we got more people to talk to. 
He exhaled sharply, the feathers in his beak next to his nose holes fluttering. Yeah? You walked past the houses and people like before, but didn't feel like waving back. The dry desert air is warm in your lungs. Blazing afternoon sun bakes the ground beneath you as you walk near the edge of town again. Your throat feels tight, feet sore. There's a gentle pounding of blood. Ugh. The yawning that I get when I just read for too long straight. Poor breath control, apparently. Just fucking up and built and just not... It, it, concentrating on reading just screws me up sometimes on that way. But they've got a they've got a rough situation here. They have an apparently queer friendly, uh, peaceful pacifist town, that would be a good option for them if they wanted to get out of these gangs that they don't seem happy with that don't value them. But it seems like both gangs already know what this place is and where it uh, and where it is, and they're planning on attacking it. And so if they if these two disappear and don't come back, they probably still they probably still show up. I wonder if they're going to have a turn of heart and figure out how to save this town. Or what kind of arc we're going to have here. The uh, itch.io page mentions a, a, a reading time of like five hours. Which probably means ten hours in my from my perspective. So we're probably, there's probably a, like a meaty amount of story here. Like in case you're tempted to think that the, you, you do these three choices and then it ends. Uh, doesn't, doesn't sound like it's the case at least. There's a gentle pounding of blood in your head, accompanied by a familiar, piercing ache. Everything seems hazier than it usually is. Thoughts are swimming. You're fine. Just keep walking. You almost bump into Joseph as he stops short, looking around again, searching for anything you might have missed. You look as well, but the sun seems... too bright somehow. You look down at your feet to shield your eyes. Staring at the tiny dunes of your footprints in the dust. Alright, so... Where to now? At least there's only one place of interest left. You heard what he said, but didn't quite stick with you. Uh... Yeah, sure. Should we get going there, then? Again... Hearing, but nothing stays. Your thoughts feel like just-caught fish wriggling from your hand. Uh... Hmm. Alright then, let's go. Yeah, let's keep moving. Joseph starts walking away and you follow. You try to follow. Your feet move, but they don't land where you want and you stumble a little. Joseph looks around at you as you stand there, staring at your feet again. Hey, what's the matter, partner? Huh? Uh, I feel... a little dizzy. You doing all right? Didn't say anything. He places his hands on your shoulders and twisted you to face him. Looking down into your face. I'm not used to visual novels using past tense for their narration. Which is how most books are written, but not how visual novels are usually written. They're usually in current tense. Hmm. Yeah, you're looking a little sick there. Let's go sit down a spell. He started walking with a hand on your shoulder, guiding you over to a ledge with a shallow drop you could both sit on and hang your legs over. You felt better sitting down, more stable. You hear the rustle of Joseph unclipping something from the back of his belt, seeing him pull a round canteen between the two of you. When's the last time you had a real drink? Must be mighty thirsty if you're feeling that dizzy. Of course, how could you have forgotten? You've been riding and walking all day but haven't had a drop of anything since you set out. Although you weren't sure what Joseph had brought with him. Ha! <laughs> What's that look for? You think I got liquor in here? 
He chuckled a little and, and unscrewed the cap, letting you smell it a moment before taking a long gulp. Just water, see? Get it down before you collapse on me or something. You sheepishly took the canteen from him and gave it a little wave in his direction as a cheers. You tilt it to your dry mouth and take deep gulps for a few seconds, licking water drops hanging off on the edge of your lips after. A bit warm for my liking, but can't beat, can't beat cold water from a clean stream, but better than drying out like your mama's washing. You take another swig before handing it back to him. Th thank you. Don't worry about it. Just pipe up next time. I almost hit the dirt just because you didn't say anything. Sorry, it was just... We have a job here. Didn't feel like I could waste time. Pusha. Can't even make time to sit down and drink. You're unlike most I meet. Who put a snake in your boot anyway? You gotta slow down a little. Hmm. Maybe. I mean, what do you do to relax when you're off the job? Relax? Yeah, you know, relax, unwind, take a load off. I, I know what you mean. The question just caught you off guard a little. You weren't sure how to answer. You'd never given it much thought. What do you do to relax? The gang is always busy with something. Traveling, hiding out, making trouble. Not a lot of time to not do anything. Ah, uh, I guess I play cards sometimes. Mostly just solitaire. Respectable? You win much? Nope. Ain't about winning anyway. Just helps to pass the time. Yeah, I know what you mean. Me and the boys usually play some rounds of cards, sometimes betting. Although some of them are real sore losers, sometimes it's easier just to let them win and avoid the issue. I beat one of them at poker five, five times in a row and I swear, the rest of the week he was giving me the eyes. Found my hot hat full of knife holes one morning too, but I think it was just to scare me. At least I hope it was. He gave out a loud guffaw, the real and unrestrained kind that made you doubt a second that if the canteen really was just water. He had a nice laugh, you thought, someone actually enjoying themselves. Maybe it was just nice to hear a laugh that wasn't done at you. You a gambling man? A flutter in your chest at the end of the ribs. Because they said man again. This is just a game about being seen. Being a uh, coming from a back a background, just being actively denied your identity, and then having someone that just acknowledges it and validates that. And how like, explosive that is at that point. Speaking of somebody who came out one year ago. Not really. Never had much to gamble in the first place. Always seemed like a waste. I can respect that restraint. Don't always have to be about money, mind you. When I was younger, me and Papa used to... He stopped for a moment, thinking and scratching his neck, his train of thought slowed by some forgotten memory. We used to play cards after dinner. And a lot of days when I can't when I come home, I'd bring pebbles from the river. I always loved how smooth and pretty they looked. All sorts of colors and shapes, all of them different. We kept them on the mantelpiece, and when we played cards, we'd bet with them. He always won, but it was too much fun for me to ever be mad. I think he did let me win though when I was betting big and was gonna lose one of the rocks I really liked. He always knew which ones were my favorite, and never wanted to see me cry. Huh. Can't think of any other reason he would have lost to me. Suppose I had to thank him for teaching me. You weren't sure what to say. You just 
gave him a soft smile. Family could be so complicated. You didn't want to say the wrong thing. Oh, you know what? He dug into a pocket and produced a tattered looking packet in his hand that he recognized to be playing cards. <sighs> what? I don't even know what that is. How about some Vigdenen? <laughs> Somehow that was worse than I thought it would be, pronunciation-wise. You played that before? And we can bet with... Uh... Hmm. He twisted around himself, looking for anything he could use as a stand-in for betting chips. He saw his eyes settle on a small pile of rocks for a moment, but instead noticed a stray feather barely holding on to the back of his hand. He plucked it and placed it in between you both, twisting how he sat to face you better. We can bet on this feather. We'll do a, a first to five. If you, you get it if you win, I keep it if I win. You swivel yourself around to sit cross-legged and face him. Didn't know you were so desperate to gamble you'd use your own body. ha de ha just that'd be more interesting than rocks. Oh, well, I, I thought you were a rock lover, Mr. Rock Collector. Take them on the open road, your little rock circus. A regular Barnum. Joseph couldn't help but smile, even through his fake pouting at your teasing. Hmm. I don't know if J.H. Barnum is quite the same ring to it, frankly. J.H.? Yeah, as in Joseph Harrier, my initials. Oh, of course. So, do you know how to play Vinktonen? I, I have no idea what this game is. Uh, nope. Alright, rules are simple. I'm the dealer. I deal you two cards face up, and deal myself one face up and one face down. Idea is just to get a high a higher number from your cards as you can without going over 21. Oh, it's your blackjack. If you go over 21, it's a bust. Same goes for me, but you need to get a, a higher number from, than me to win. A draw is called a push. You can hit to get another card or stand to stick with what you have. You can hit as many times as you like as long as you're under 21. After you stand, I flip over my face down card and have to hit as long as it's under 17. If I go bust or my number is lower than yours, you win. If you get 21 exactly, you don't have then you, then you don't hit or stand, and I can get a, a push in that case if I also get 21. Cards are worth what the number says. Uh, face cards like king, queen, jack are 10. Where things get a little conf confusing is that Ace is worth either 1 or 11. Ace is worth 11 in a hand, unless it would be a bust, in which case it's just a 1. Ace can still be an 11 if you if it would let you win. Gets a little muddy during games sometimes, but I ain't trying to teach cheat you, so don't worry about it too much. Right, let's play. Like I said, first of five wins. Oh, we're actually playing. Uh, I win. <laughs> You've got the Queen of Clubs and Ace of Diamonds, making your total 21. A natural. And they have a 14. And I win. Uh, 20. I'm definitely standing. 19. I win. Full of 9. Hit. Full of 20. Stand. These are, this is the best blackjack game I've ever played. Holy shit. Yep, and but wow. Three in a row. I got a 21, a 20, and a 20. Holy shit. Oh, we're still going, even though I got the win. 20! What the fuck is happening? Is this rigged? I have never been this lucky in blackjack. Oh, I'm not. I'm not drawing on a 17, though, but that's riskier. This is the worst card. This is the worst draw I've had so far. No one wins. Go again. 13 is hit. 17 stand. 
20 I lose. I lost one of them. God damn. Wait, we're still going? Oh, first two five. Whoops. 20. I did damn. F fuck. Stand. 18. And I win. Done. Well, there you have it. Take your prize, sir. You took the feather in your hand, twisting the smooth black, qu smooth quill back and forth a couple times between your thumb and forefinger. It was thin and tapered, and the color of coffee. Thick, uneven stripes of cream, of cream white ran all along it from the middle. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Don't mention it. You pocketed the feather carefully. We should probably, uh, get back to it. As long as you're happy to, and can stand steady when I'm ready to. Uh, then I'm ready to. I'm fuck, I'm falling apart here. It is midnight. <laughs> you swung yourself onto your knees and stood up with a sprightly jump. All ready. Let's get a wiggle on. <laughs> yes, sir. Sheriff should know something, surely. Yes, sir. I doubt we're the uh, only ones who've come looky looky looing before. <laughs> and Sheriff did say some to come find him if we needed anything. There we go. Alright, I'm gonna call it here because we're an hour in, but this has been Lookouts. If you want to check out the game any further, there's an itch there's an itch.io link in the description. See you guys next time.